We are broadcasting live spine surgery from the operating room at Duke Spine Institute and the Surgery Center of Vieira. And our second patient for the day will be another endoscopic Duke laser disc repair. Our patient has a herniated disc with a spondylolisthesis at 045, grade one. Most surgeons, if they were going to try to fix this problem, would do a fusion surgery with the decompression because he has leg symptoms. Fusion by itself won't fix a pinched nerve. Leg symptoms usually come from a pinched nerve or an irritated nerve. So this patient did not want a fusion. He wanted something less invasive. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery in the world to fix back pain and leg symptoms from a herniated disc or spondylolisthesis. So that's what we're going to be doing. All right, sir, Dr. Duke Majin, are you okay? Are you comfortable? If you could repeat what he... All right. You're going to feel a little stick and burn. That's the pain medicine going in to numb things up, okay? Just like at the dentist's office. We're going to give it a minute to work, and then we're going to get started. If you feel pain throughout the procedure, just say, ouch. And that will tell me you're having pain, and I'll give you some more medicine, okay? Now, we're going to put you to sleep, but it's going to be about five minutes before we get you to sleep, okay? It's real important you stay still and don't move. All right, that's my hand feeling around on your back. I'm feeling for the iliac crest, the top of the iliac crest. That's an important landmark. Little stick and burn, okay? That's just the numbing medicine going in. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's okay. It'll be all right. You're doing great. You're doing really good. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's just no easy way to do that. What some, some of my other colleagues, the anesthesiologists do, sometimes they'll, you know, either give the patient some, something to yeah, help them. Either, I don't know about Versed, maybe Versed, maybe, uh, you know, a dissociative agent, whatever you think is appropriate. Um, we use seven cc's. I think of all the anesthesiologists I've worked with, Dr. Santiago from down in Fort Lauderdale, the patients never complain, they never move, it's perfect. He, and he said, well, I know when you go in with the dilator, that's when they have the pain and when you use the laser and you come out. So he gives a little extra propofol and, but if you look at his records, you might see what he does if you're interested and I know you haven't done a lot of these. All right, we're going to get started. You let me know if you're feeling a lot of pain, okay? Can you hear me? Shot. In the meantime, I'll be talking to my team, lateral. I can't tell if that's L45 or L34. That may be L34. <coughs> It looks like L34 probably. Yeah, that's L34. So we're going to come a little bit lower. Let me have the skin numbing medicine just to be sure. Let me know if you feel any discomfort, okay? All right, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Blood pressure is good. We're going to start a little bit lower. Shot. Now, one thing you can notice is compared to the last surgery I did, his spine looks completely different. Like we can see the foramen, we can see the end plates lining up on almost every level. You know, like that's because there's not much scoliosis or deformity. So L45 looks perfect. There's a little bit of listhesis. We call it a grade one spondylolisthesis or slippage shot and we're going to aim right for that disc and the other thing to take notice of is look at the pedicles of l5 look at how short they are that would be the the pedicle right below where the needle is
Shot. You okay? Let me give you some more numbing medicine to make that a bit more comfortable for you. So right now I'm well outside the foramen. I'm not anywhere near the nerve root and I'm just doing an, basically an intramuscular injection of a little bit of the numbing medicine, which is the lidocaine marcaine. And I'm gonna give that a second to work. You can see we're well into the muscle there, not anywhere near the spine. I don't wanna accidentally get the nerve root shot. If I get the nerve root numbed up, then he's gonna have weird sensations in his leg and possibly some weakness. We don't want any of that shot. Shot. Of course, all that would wear off after surgery. I mean, after the medicine wears off, after a few hours. But I don't want any of that. Shot. He's got quite a large facet complex. Shot. Are you okay? an AP. Yeah, that's the facet. All right, well, go back to a lateral, please. So we're a little bit higher than I want to be. I'm going to adjust my trajectory a little bit because it's important that you really try to make it as perfect as possible. Shot. Again. So I'm going to come a little bit more lateral. Shot. Again, it's higher than I want it to be. Shot. That's getting better. Once again, the enlarged facet complex which I'm not happy about, but that's him. Are you comfortable? Let me know if you feel any pain. Anything? Where does he have pain? Shot. In your back or your leg? Just the back? All right. Everybody agree we're at 4-5? Give me an AP, please. <coughs> so as far as the navigation of the needle goes, I'm very happy. Those two squiggly lines that you're seeing are just the sponge. Um, but otherwise, the needle's in perfect position. Go back to a lateral view, please. You can see on that AP view we just took where the needle is. If you go to the midline, you can see the spinous processes. There's a little bit of scoliosis going on. So we've got some slippage of one bone on the other. L4 is slipping forward on L5. We call that lysis. And then you can also see some scoliosis. You can see the offset of the, of the uh, spinous processes. So this is clearly an, an abnormal level. Are you comfortable? Yeah? Okay, we're going to put you to sleep soon. Now, our patient here has a herniated disc at L4-5 along with a little bit of scoliosis, about 10 degrees, and a little bit of listhesis, maybe at most uh, 8 millimeters, a sonometer at most. But he also has something else he was born with. If you look at the pedicle of L5, it's short. Compared to L4, L3, the pedicles get longer. So he's got congenitally short pedicle at L5. And that's just something he was born with, but I see that a lot in patients with back pain and leg symptoms. So there's almost always a short pedicle that you see. Are you comfortable? Yes? How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? What was the highest it went? 10. Is that where you get your back pain typically? Is that where you get your back pain? 
All right, concordant, 10 out of 10, L4, 5. Now, for those of you looking at the x-ray on the side view, you can see the dye is leaking out backwards, the same direction the needle's coming in from. That's the back of the disc. There's a huge tear, giant tear, at least a sonometer, maybe a sonometer and a half in width. And all the dye is leaking out through that tear. That's where his back pain's coming from. We can put him to sleep. Sir, go ahead and count from 1 to 100 out loud for me, Sean. Count from 1 to 100 out loud. Start with 1. Nice and loud. Keep going. Shot. So I'm going to remove the needle and leave the guide wire. Shot. Okay. So our patient has back pain and leg pain. When I asked him which is worse before surgery, he said 50-50. My back is equal to my leg pain. And then um, I know why his leg is bothering him because that annular tear is leaking inflammatory chemicals onto the nerve root that's right behind it. The nerve root's literally passing right behind the back of the disc. And that herniated disc with the tear is causing inflammation and the inflammation material is getting on the nerve root causing a radiculitis. A radiculitis is inflammation of the nerve root it actually causes pain down the leg. It causes, uh, it can cause numbness and tingling and even weakness, okay? You don't need a radiculopathy, which is damage to the nerve, compression damage. You don't need a radiculopathy in order to have radicular symptoms. Are you comfortable? Is he asleep yet? Are you still counting? All right, so he's a one level, L45, whereas the last surgery we did three levels. And that lady is already going home right now. All right, you're fine. Just relax. You're doing good. Everything's okay. I can wait a minute. You can see the tip of the dilator is just about to enter the foramen where the nerves are. So I'm going to wait a minute until my anesthesiologist tells me that he's ready. And... <coughs> Everything's fine. You're doing great. Lay still. He's not moving or anything, but uh, this is where we put our patient to sleep. And when he wakes up, we'll be done with the surgery. Now, you can already see the dye that was leaking out the back of the disc is pretty much almost gone. And the dye that's in the center of the disc is still there. The part that leaked out, why is it gone? The million dollar question, anybody know the answer? Why is all the dye gone? Do, 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 do. You know, Alec Trevec died, I think yesterday, didn't he? Yeah. So the reason the dye is gone is because number one, it was in the tear, which was an opening, so it's kind of leaked out. But number two, where did I tell you all the inflammation is? It's in the tear. Inflammation means blood flow, blood supply. So it's already cleared out and removed all the dye because it's highly vascular. Shot? Okay. Shot? Boy, that's a big tear. It's just going right in, easy. Shot? I barely have to even hit the, the dilator. It just goes in so easy. So the bigger the tear, shot, the easier the dilator goes in. Shot. All right. So now, for those of you who have not seen the surgery done before, we're doing the entire surgery through this little shake straw. This shake straw is made out of metal. comes from Germany. It is, all this stuff is FDA approved. We don't do anything that is illegal or unapproved. Um, and the entire surgery will be done through this little tube. And the way we do this, folks, is endoscopically. This is true endoscopic spine surgery. We use an endoscope, camera, light source, irrigation, 
suction. And I'm gonna put the endoscope down this tube like this. And at the, at the end right here is where I bring the laser out and I do all the surgery at the end right there. And I can actually see, go ahead and turn the scope on. So our audience can see how much light there is that's gonna come out. You see that? That's pretty well lit. Okay, we use fiber optics. We use a fiber optic illumination and we use fiber optic uh, to bring the image, the camera image to the camera. So it's a, it's a, actually this is a rod lens system, I apologize. The cervical is fiber optic, the light system is fiber optic, but the optical system is rod lens. Okay, all right, so turn the scope off. We'll be back to the scope in a minute, but in the meantime, I'm gonna bring this tubular retractor down. People call this a percutaneous surgery, but it's not. Percutaneous really means through the skin, but it, percutaneous procedures are needle-based procedures. They're done with needles. This is not being done with a needle. We use the needle in the beginning, but so does every surgery. You have to inject medicine into the skin, right? You have to use a needle. So just because we use the needle in the beginning does not make this percutaneous. This is a true surgical procedure. It's done endoscopically. Is that Sean? Yes? Okay, shot. Okay, looks good. What's going on in pre-op? Everything okay? Huh? Oh, next patient is. Why are they? Why are we having so many anxious patients? How about how about just telling them everything's going to be okay? What I mean, find out why they're anxious. But why is she crying? Find out why they're anxious before we just start slugging them with medicine. I want to. I want them. I want to know what their issues are. Is she a smoker? I mean, somebody should talk to her. It's the least invasive spine surgery in the world. There's no reason to be anxious. All right, all right. So have Ann go talk to her. Yeah, thanks for telling me, Luis. You're right. Okay, we're gonna get started. Now you're gonna be able to see what I'm seeing inside the disc. That's the inside of the disc right there. Actually, I'm gonna clean this because it's got some bubbleish stuff on the end. I remember the first time I ever saw endoscopic surgery, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. <coughs> then again, I thought that for every kind of surgery that I saw. All right, so we're inside the disc. Yes. We just have a quick question. Sure. One Laser. of our viewers is wondering, was this patient's symptoms more focused on the pain or the nerve symptoms? Well, the nerve symptoms are pain, right? So the question is, was this patient's symptoms more focused on the pain or the nerve symptoms. I, I assume what you're asking, were they more concerned about their back pain or with their leg, their leg symptoms, their leg pain and leg tingling or numbness? So all the symptoms are due to nerves. Any back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain, any um, arm, leg, discomfort, tingling, numbness, weakness, every symptom in the human body is relayed by nerves. And what I'm gonna assume is that you're asking, was, was this patient's primary problem their back pain? Okay, I can't move this. You're holding it and keeping it from moving. Was this, that's better. Was this patient's primary problem their back pain or their leg symptoms from the nerve root? The nerve root symptoms that go down the leg. He told me it was 50-50. I asked him that exact question before surgery and he said 50-50. It's really 50% back pain and 50% leg, leg symptoms, like leg pain, tingling, 
numbness and weakness. By the way, that's a very common answer. And we ask all of our patients we do surgery on to tell us what the percentage of back versus leg symptoms or neck versus arm symptoms is. So procedures like a microdiscectomy on the lower back for a herniated disc or a laminectomy, those procedures only help leg symptoms. They don't help back pain. And then procedures like fusion, which address disc pain, will help with the, with the back pain. So the Duke Laser Disc Repair procedure you're watching now with the laser, this fixes back and leg symptoms. I'm gonna try to improve the focus just a little bit. There we go. What you're seeing at 12 o'clock, by the way, up there, those are veins. Those are some veins in the epidural space. And this is all the annular tear right here. This giant thing is where this patient's problem is coming from. There's a herniation here and a tear. It's a huge tear in the annulus. It goes from this side over to this side. So this patient injured their disc um, through some type of a traumatic injury that has allowed the jelly to kind of squeeze out into the tear. And once the jelly gets in the tear, the tear won't be able to heal itself, period. And what you're seeing right here is a little bit of fat. Each of those little glistening spots is a fat cell. And um, you know, we're not here to remove fat, obviously, but it gets in the way, so I have to zap it away with the laser. It doesn't hurt the patient at all to have that fat zapped away. People actually pay money for that, to have fat removed from their body. So what am I doing here? I'm cleaning this in area up by removing the damaged tissues here so that what's left will be able to heal. I'm not actually healing the disc. That's not possible. Doctors can't heal things. We can only um, debride them or set them so that they will heal properly. But the human body is the only way to heal things. The human body has to do the healing. We can't do the healing. We only create an environment, we call it an environment, that can heal properly. We give the body its best chance of healing. Right now, he's trying to heal this disc herniation, but he can't. He hasn't been able to on his own. That's why he's had pain. The pain is part of the healing process, but when you keep having pain on and on and on, it means your body has not been able to heal it on its own. All of this stuff you're seeing, this white stuff, is all damaged tissue and none of it's normal, it shouldn't be here, it shouldn't be like this. So I'm zapping this stuff away so that it'll stimulate a response within the annulus to heal. And by removing the jelly that's in here, the blue stuff, I'm actually gonna let it heal properly because it can't heal properly with the nucleus the material in there. I'm, I hate to say I'm removing the diseased tissue, but that's exactly what I'm doing because people, when they hear the word disease, they think of the wrong thing. They think of something like leprosy, you know, but we're not removing infected material. We're just removing diseased tissue. Disease just refers to an abnorm abnormality of tissue, but it doesn't specify infection. It just means it's abnormal diseased tissue. And that's what I'm removing is diseased tissue. But this tissue is disease because um, the nuclear material is wedged into the annular tear and it's creating inflammation and it's, it's been doing that for a long time. So I'm removing the damaged disease tissue to allow the normal tissue to come back and heal properly. It's kind of like, I hate to use the analogy, but it's a good analogy because people understand it. I'm like, I'm like popping a zit and getting all the, all the, let's say pus out 
and that lets the skin heal normally without being in pain. So that's what I'm doing. I'm basically popping a zit down here and cleaning up the uh, diseased parts of the tissue so that it'll heal. And when it heals, the pain will be gone, the swelling will be gone, the redness will be gone, all the inflammation will go away. Everybody knows what the four hallmarks of inflammation are, right? Swelling, redness, pain, and what's called calor, which is temperature, warm temperature. So we're getting rid of the inflammation. We're getting rid of the pain and swelling that's going on in the annular tear. You have a question. Why is my, why is the laser stopped again? Luis? Why does that happen? Okay. No, 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 no. This is under warranty. You tell them what's happening. Send them an email and CC me. I don't want there to be an issue and then they, sell, they tell us it's gonna be $10,000 to fix it. it. It's still under warranty and I want it notified that there's a problem the machine is stopping on its own it's not supposed to do that I mean it's still working fine but I don't want that continuing they need to send somebody out here to look at it yes Sean what's the question one of our viewers is wondering Dr. Duke have you ever abraded the in plates to create bleeding within the disc space to regenerate degenerated discs all right I I, I heard half of the question Sean um, if you could repeat the question again, something about debriding the end plates to regenerate the disc. But I didn't really hear all the question. Yes, they, they're wondering if you believe in scratching or abrading the end plates to create bleeding that helps with regeneration of the disc. Okay, so one of our viewers says, Dr. Duke, if you go over to the end plate and you debride it or scratch it and it starts to bleed, will that help regenerate the disc? The answer is no, absolutely not. Um, so let me tell you why. This nucleus material in the disc that you're talking about regenerating, when people talk about regenerating the disc, they're talking about they're regenerating one of the two parts of the disc. It's called the nucleus propulsus, okay? So it's important to understand the disc has two parts. It has an, an outer part, this white stuff here called the annulus fibrosus, and it's got a jelly in the center right there called the nucleus propulsus. Okay, and the outer stuff is torn and that's allowed the jelly to squeeze out some of it to create inflammation in this area. And that's where the pain comes from in the back, back pain and, and leg symptoms. So this jelly down here, the nucleus propulsus, is re a remnant, what's called a remnant. It means it's what's left over of a very important structure embryologically called the notochord, N-O-T-O. C-O-R-D, notochord, okay? So um, if you go back and you look at the developing fetus, a fetus that develops inside of a, a human, a woman obviously, a womb, that fetus starts out as just a sperm and an egg coming together, and then they, um, the sperm puts its DNA into the egg, and then the egg starts to divide, grow and divide, okay? And it turns into a human being, okay? So as it's growing and dividing, it's the cells that are created from growth and division start to specialize into uh, special cells that have very specific functions, okay? And as you get more and more cells in the fetus, you start to develop things like what are called the, the three primary tissues, which are endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And one of those tissues, the, the neuroectoderm, creates something called the notochord. And the notochord is a very interesting tissue that literally orchestrates the development of the entire fetus. And then when the fetus is done developing into what looks like a human, a baby, the notochord becomes this stuff down here, the nucle nucleus propulsus it becomes the nucleus propulsus, you understand? So the most important 
germ layer or tissue of embryological development, the notochord, which you cannot create a human being without it, literally becomes a jelly in the center of your disc. So when you're asking me, can you regenerate that jelly? No, it's created during embryological development and you never create it again in your entire life. And it's meant to stay deep inside your disc and not come out. Because once your inflammatory system sees it, it treats it like a foreign body. Because it, it's foreign to your body. And why is it foreign? Because there's no blood supply to the center of the disc. So your inflammatory system travels around where the blood vessels are. And it sees everything that the blood system sees. But your blood system never sees the center of your disc because the nuclear material stays in the center of the disc where there's no blood supply. And so when some of that jelly comes out, this is, of course, my, my ideas, not just theories, but they've been proven that when that jelly comes out and it's seen by the inflammatory system, it stimulates a massive inflammatory response. <laughs> We're done, by the way. That inflammatory response is what causes the pain in the back or the neck or the thoracic spine, if you have a herniated disc there, that's symptomatic. And it causes the pain down the nerve root, down into the leg or arm, depending on where your herniation is. Or in your thoracic spine, it can cause pain ar wrapping around your rib cage. We call that radiculopathy or radiculitis. So pain wrapping around a nerve root down the leg, around the ribs, or down the arm is radiculitis. That's from the inflammation caused by the nucleus propulsus that's now exposed to the inflammatory system because it's now sitting inside the outer annulus and it's causing inflammation in the outer annulus and that's where your back pain comes from. That is the discovery of Dr. Duke Majin and Duke Spine Institute. That's why we developed the Duke Laser Disc Repair to repair the annular tear, get rid of the interposed nuclear material that's causing the inflammation and allow the disc to heal properly. We're the first in the world to describe this, this process of repairing the disc this way through annular debridement. And that was published in 2012 in the National Library of Medicine. So if you go back and look in the journal called Surgical Neurology International, just look up Duke Laser Disc Repair. You'll see a, a reference in PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. That's the National Library of Medicine in the United States. So we published our findings and our results of our surgery very early on in 2012, 2013, in a couple of different publications. But the point is, is that that nuclear material that squeezes out, the jelly from the center of the disc, can never be recreated. It was created by, uh, by the fetus, basically by very early development in, in the first uh, trimester of fetal development. So there is no synthetic nuclear material. People have tried to make synthetic nuclear material, but and put it in the center of the disc, but it doesn't work because it always squeezes out through the tear they make in the annulus. Good question. Any other questions before I leave? Uh, we have one more. Uh, our viewer is wondering, does BMAC or PRP stem cell therapy help with degenerated discs? All right, so great question. I'm gonna answer that in a few minutes when I come over to the conference room, but I wanna show our audience right now the incision. So the disc was repaired through, look at this little incision, it's seven millimeters. It's half of the width of a dime. So if you've got a dime sitting in your change purse, pull it out and look at that. That's half the width of a dime. And we did the whole disc repair. Otherwise, this patient would have had a fusion anywhere else they went. I'll come over to the conference room and answer that question. In the meantime, people uh, write up your questions for me and I'll be happy to answer them for you. I'll be right back. Okay, good job, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No problem. EBL, I'm going to call one mil. No complications. DLDR. This was a left. L45. Let's see. Thank you. I'm going to go check the next patient and I'm going to head over to the conference room. Good job.
All right, Dr. Duke Majin here. For those of you who stuck around, I've seen our next patient, and she's going to be a Duke laser disc repair, L45, L5S1, two levels, right approach. She's having intermittent numbness down her right leg from pinched nerve due to the herniated disc. She's having back pain. She also has pain in her SI joints on both sides and her buttocks. So she'll be getting a bilateral sacroiliac joint injection as well by Dr. Patel and bilateral piriformis muscle injection to treat piriformis syndrome. So she's got more than one cause of back pain. Remember we talked earlier, for those of you who are here, that there are about 32 different causes of back pain and everybody comes in with a different cause or two and we, I try to identify for each person what their cause is and treat that. It doesn't mean that later on, you know, a month later or six years later, they won't develop a different cause of back pain and then have to have treatment in that other area, but that can happen. All right, so we do have a question and Sean's gonna help us by reading the question and who asked it, and then I'll answer it for you. So we have one of our followers on Facebook who's wondering, can BMAC and PRP stem cell therapy help with degenerated discs or would DLDR be the better therapy for it? Okay, great question, thank you. So the question is really centered around um, alternative treatment methods to eliminate back pain, I suppose, from a herniated disc and leg symptoms from a herniated disc instead of using the laser surgery to debride the annular tear, remove the herniation that I do, uh, could we do instead PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, or BMAC, which is a bone um, cytokine um, uh, material? And the answer is that the PRP and BMAC are pro-inflammatory. They actually stimulate inflammation to increase. So the idea would be kind of like you've got a forest fire burning and that's the, the pain from the disc herniation. What happens if we burn more of the forest around the, the area that's burning in order to stop the fire from spreading? And that does work sometimes, uh, but sometimes doing what's called a control burn uh, to the normal forest can actually make things worse. And control burns can get out of hand and you can actually have more of the forest burned up as a result of our interventions with fire, using fire to fight fire. So basically, by using PRP and BMAC, you're, or even stem cells, you're basically trying to promote inflammation in the area where there already is inflammation in order to get the inflammation to stop. And you're basically trying to burn out the inflammation. So does it work? In my experience with using uh, stem cells and, and PRP, in a herniation, they actually have caused more problems for the patient initially and for several months after the surgery than they did solve problem. So in my opinion, no, they're not as good as the Duke laser disc repair. Um, what would they be like? On a scale of one to 10, I'd give them a two, uh, and I put the Duke laser disc repair at a 10. So I put fusion at about a six, or a seven, if it's done by me, then it could be an eight or a nine. Uh, but most doctors that do fusion, they don't do it right. So most fusions are about a five or a six. If it's a really bad fusion, then maybe a four. But I'd say an average of five and a half for fixing pain. But I put those other things like uh, PRP and BMAC and stem cells, so I put them around a, a two out of 10 for actually fixing the problem. That was our only question that is outstanding. And uh, at this point, we'll take a short break and we'll be back with our third surgery of the day. It's another Duke laser disc repair for two herniated discs in someone's back. This lady has had back pain going into her right leg intermittently and she has intermittent numbness down her right leg uh, in the distribution of the L5 and S1 nerve roots. So we're gonna go in and repair her herniated discs at L45, L5S1. She's also going to get bilateral SI joint injection and bilateral piriformis muscle injection by Dr. Patel. Thanks.